Do you want to learn about data analytics but have no idea where to start? If so, this seven session definitive guide to data analytics training series is for you. Hi, my name is Brian Amrine, co-founder and principal analytics consultant at Value Driven Analytics, and I'm so excited to offer you this free training series. This is a great course for high school or college students exploring possible careers, or professionals looking to make a career change or step up their career in analytics, or even retirees looking at analytics as a potential hobby. Before we get into the course, I want to share a little bit about my background with you. Even though this course is completely free, it's important to make sure you're getting sound advice from someone with experience in this area. I've worked in the analytics industry for more than a dozen years, across four major corporations, up to the director level, and across several different functional areas like sales, marketing, finance, and operations. I've built more than 100 data science models, and I've broken into people leadership at two different companies. But most importantly, I'm so passionate about training anyone who wants to learn how to develop their career in analytics. At every company I've worked for, and even outside of work, I've proactively led analytics learning initiatives on topics like SQL, Python, machine learning, analytics soft skills, and more. And now, my company, Value Driven Analytics, is bringing you this free, on-demand analytics training series. Essentially, I want to take the fundamentals of my 13 years working in analytics and boil it down to seven easy-to-follow training sessions. The Definitive Guide to Data Analytics training series is designed to be a fairly comprehensive introduction to analytics. It starts with this very video, where I'll provide an overview of analytics, including what an analytics career could look like, the skills required, an overview of common platforms used, an overview of common analytics techniques used, and some examples of common analysis requests. Then, in the next five videos after that, I'll provide an overview and hands-on demo that you can follow along with of several popular analytics tools, including Excel, Power BI, Python, SQL, and even data science modeling. Finally, the last session will cover all kinds of analytics soft skills that are critical to career advancement as an analyst. Skills like leadership, communication, project management, and more. After going through all seven sessions, you'll have a broad understanding of much of what's involved with being an analyst. And if you want to continue to pursue a career in analytics, the additional resources and homework exercises I'll recommend after each session will provide a deeper dive into each topic. With that said, let's jump in and start your journey into analytics. Welcome back to the Definitive Guide to Data Analytics, brought to you by Value Driven Analytics, your source for rigorous, affordable, and fast analytics consulting services. I'm so excited to get into our introduction to analytics today. It's primarily going to be in PowerPoint, but as we proceed into the next five sessions in the training series, we're actually going to get into the tools we're going to cover, starting with Excel, one of the most popular data manipulation tools out there. We'll follow that up with Power BI, which is a great example of an interactive visualization tool. We can take reporting and turn it into an automated interactive experience for your stakeholders. It's great. Then we'll get into Python coding, which is extremely common for advanced analytics and data science. Really important to know that. Uh, also great for automation. Then we'll get into SQL, and SQL is just an analytic staple that's been around for a long time, and it's worth investing in because you can write SQL in nearly every other analytics platform. You really want to learn SQL. Then we'll get into data science modeling, uh, the ability to create predictions and even prescribe what factors might be driving a target variable. It is so helpful. Uh, we'll talk about statistical models. We'll talk about machine learning models. There is a lot to learn. And this is a hot topic in analytics. Finally, if you want to grow your career, you're going to have to master some skills beyond just the technical skills we just talked about. 
You're going to need to be a good communicator, a good project manager, even a good leader. And those are skills we're going to talk about in the seventh session of the series. With that said, let's get into our introduction to analytics training session. In today's session, we're going to talk about what it's like to be in an analytics role, which includes some of the benefits of being an analyst, some of the industries that hire analysts, what a career path could look like in analytics, and the type of companies that are using analytics. Then we'll get into the skills that if you're convinced that you want to become an analyst, that you're going to need to actually get the job. Things like having an analytical thought process, good attention to detail, and good communication, and several other skills as well. Then we'll talk about some platforms that you should at least be familiar with if you're going to be in the analytics industry. Platforms like Excel, Altrix, Nime, SQL, SAS, R, Python, Power BI, and Tableau. Now we're not going to do a deep dive on all of these. You saw the five platforms that we're going to actually have a dedicated session to, but these other tools are fairly common in the analytics industry and you should at least be aware of them. It's very likely that if you know one tool in that space, such as an interactive visualization tool, it'll be easy to learn another analytics visual uh, tool in the same category. For instance, if you know Power BI, it should be fairly easy to learn Tableau or vice versa. So it's good to know at least one tool, and we're going to cover that in the series. Then we'll get in some technique overviews. Analytics techniques are things like exploring and pooling data. That's usually where you start. Then manipulating data. Then building a dashboard. Aggregating and grouping data. Trending data over time. Uh, building a statistical analysis. Building a data science model. And one of my personal favorites, performing an A-B test to really determine what an initiative actually drove. Finally, we'll wrap it up with some example requests that you might get as an analyst and some next steps. Yes, if you choose to accept it, you'll have homework assignment to do for the next session. All right, let's get into our overview of an analytics career. Let's talk about some of the benefits of being an analyst. And as you can tell from this slide, there are a lot of them. First off, People who go into analytics usually enjoy their job, and that can be for a lot of different reasons for each person, but a few of them would include being able to spend your day researching life's phenomenons. You're a, a scientist in some cases. In fact, well, popular analytical role is called a data scientist. Uh, another benefit of being an analyst is getting to work on usually a variety of challenges. You're usually not working on the same thing every day. There's a lot of variety. Keeps things interesting. Also, you're usually constantly learning and developing new skills. Even if you're doing uh, using the same tools, uh, but you're doing a different analysis, you're applying it to something different, you're developing that analytical thought process with every analysis. You're building your methodology, your creativity. In some cases, you are learning new platforms and new skills. There's so much opportunity to be a lifelong learner as an analyst. But I will say, be careful because some people like it so much that it can be addicting. Now, analytics is typically a desk job, which for some people, may not be a good thing. Some people really enjoy being outside and enjoying the weather, but on those days where it's raining or maybe it's not so great weather, it's kind of nice to have a desk job. <laughs> That's personal preference right there. Uh, the skill set that comes with being an analyst oftentimes doesn't just come in handy at work. It can also come in handy in your personal life. Maybe in your finances, building a spreadsheet that can help you track your expenses. Uh, it could come in handy if you're applying analytics to a sports team that you're a fan of or trying to automate something. Maybe you're even performing an analysis on your stock portfolio. The skills that you build at work can easily translate to your personal life. One benefit of being an analyst compared to other some other roles is the impact that you can have 
not just in your own contributions to a company, but as an analyst, you get to make recommendations that impact a variety of people. There's a lot of responsibility there, but the impact that you can have can usually scale beyond just yourself. And as a result, uh, at a data-driven company at least, analysts often get to make some of the biggest decisions. It's up to you ultimately as the analyst to recommend what the data-driven thing to do is. And if it's a data-driven company and you're doing a good job of communicating your recommendation, odds are they're gonna follow what you recommend. Again, a lot of responsibility. And that goes along with the next point, the next benefit of being an analyst, which is the exposure that you often get to senior executives. Uh, you're trying to help them make more data-driven decisions in a lot of cases as an analyst. That's a great development and networking opportunity. And going along with that as well is the high degree of respect that analysts often get. You know, other positions often bring opinions, maybe occasionally some qualitative research, but analysts, they bring the data. And as long as the analyst preserves that trust through accurate, robust, integrity-driven analysis from reporting, an, anal an analyst work is often taken as fact, and it takes precedence over opinions at a data-driven company. So there's a great deal of respect uh, as an analyst. In addition, there's usually no shortage of career opportunities. Demand often outweighs supply of qualified candidates. So there's job security there. And that, uh, if you're an economist, you know that when the uh, demand exceeds the supply, that increases the price. And yes, uh, an analytics role usually comes with a solid starting compensation and big earning potential as you grow your career, especially if you become a data scientist or a manager or beyond. There's great potential to move into an executive role as well, especially if you're at a data-driven company. Who better to make those big decisions than somebody who understands the data and can assess when an analysis has been done correctly or incorrectly? If a, if a company's committed to data-driven decisions, it's going to look really good if they can trust you uh, based on your analytics background to be a data-driven executive as well. Another neat thing about being an analyst is that you can easily switch between and go into just about any industry or functional area or discipline. It leads to the potential for a varied career, which certainly many people have, but with analytics, you can have a varied career. You can be in all kinds of functional areas and industries, but still see progression. You don't have to start over whenever you go to a new industry like you might in other professions. Finally, these days, there's many remote and hybrid roles available for analysts, which for some people can be convenient and it increases the number of job opportunities available. So as you can see, there are a lot of benefits of being an analyst. Now let's talk about which industries and disciplines analytics can be applied to. The answer in short is just about any industry and just about any discipline. But let's see some specific examples. In the manufacturing context, you may have heard of the concept of Six Sigma, continuous improvement. That is a statistical based approach to improving a process. So analytics is very popular in manufacturing. A lot of times we want to understand how product quality uh, is trending. And you might use an interactive dashboard to look at that so that you can drill into it and so that it's automatically updated. Next in the marketing field, we want to understand what marketing initiatives have the highest return on investment. We have to figure out how much sales each marketing initiative is driving, and then compare that to the cost. And we could use a variety of tools uh, to do all of those things. When it comes to sales, we're very interested in understanding which prospects or maybe past customers are most likely to buy so that we can help our sales force prioritize their time with those customers or prospects that they're gonna see the most value in calling. In the finance world, we'd wanna probably 
trend out profit or sales uh, and understand uh, what that trend looks like. And again, an interactive dashboarding solution like Power BI or Tableau is a great way to do that. So that if we wanna dive into a particular geography or business segment, it's easy to do that and quick to do that. In the HR field, uh, which is becoming a more and more popular field to apply analytics to, there is this notion of looking at the biggest drivers of employee retention. Hopefully your company is looking at that and not just looking at it, but taking action. Wouldn't that be good? Uh, but yes, every company wants to drive employee retention and engagement. And so it's possible that an analysis could be done to determine what types of things influence retention the most? That'd be a great data science model use case. In the medical field, I can't even count the number of people that are dedicated to determining what the impact of a treatment is on a patient outcome. Obviously, regulatory institutions want to know that. They want to know it with statistical significance before they're going to permit a drug to, to be used. And so that's a very important analysis, brings in a lot of statistics, a lot of data science. And in the sports world, over the past 20 or 30 years, there has been more and more analysis applied to figuring out things like which athlete attributes actually translate to better game performance. And that'll allow them to perhaps draft the best players. So many things that can be done in the sports industry. And in the stock market industry, we might use analytics to determine how volatile or variable or risky, all different ways of saying the same thing, uh, a, a stock's price has been in the past so that we can ultimately model our portfolio in a way that has the right risk pro, uh, profile that we're looking for. Again, in short, analytics can be applied to just about any industry or discipline. Now let's talk about what an analyst's career path could look like. One of the most common roles that a beginner employee would go into in analytics would be simply an analyst. That's a very common title. Uh, however, and, and I would encourage more companies to consider this, some companies will take perhaps a person who doesn't have much experience in analytics but has a great interest in learning, and perhaps the company has learning resources for them available to help them eventually become an analyst, they might bring a person into a junior analyst role and start there. Uh, from there, a lot of analysts, perhaps two, three, four, five, or more years into their career, everyone's project, uh, pro trajectory is different. It depends on the company a lot of times. Uh, would eventually become a senior analyst. They've proven that they can conduct analysis in a rigorous way, they're independent, they are quick, they're efficient, uh, they illustrate some of the soft skills, maybe a little bit of leadership and good project management, good communication, and so they are promoted to a senior analyst role. Now, in some cases, there's a role in between, sometimes these are even interchangeable, called analyst two. Uh, it's a little less common, uh, but that can be uh, especially a step towards senior analyst. Now, there's also this concept of a data engineer, and really the data engineer role, it's a different role. It has a different connotation than a senior analyst. When you think about a data engineer role, a lot of times it, it'd be on a, perhaps a similar pay scale to a senior analyst in my experience. Uh, but a data engineer is really focused on building data sets, especially for a data scientist uh, to ultimately take and build uh, a model on top of that data set. So there are different roles. In fact, a lot of analysts and analyst twos and senior analysts, they build data sets as well. And sometimes the data scientists will both build the data set and build the model on top of it. Just a, a lot of different models you have out there for uh, specialized roles versus more generalized roles. Eventually, you get into the data scientist role. Now, some people coming out of a program or with some experience in, in modeling and machine learning might go directly into a data scientist role or, again, a little less common, 
a junior data scientist role. Maybe uh, you haven't built too many models at this point. You're still learning some things about data science, uh, but the company believes that they can trust you as a junior data scientist and will help you learn from there to, to eventually get into a regular data scientist role and perhaps eventually a senior data scientist role. And at certain companies, this is quite rare, but especially at a technology company, there could be even a principal data scientist role. And the term principal almost has this concept of a leader in the industry. Um, and so it's oftentimes not even an option at most companies, but at technology companies where the technology at that company is a critical part of how they make their money, uh, they, they may indeed create a principal role, whether it's a data scientist role or another IT related role. And a lot of times that's on par with a director people leader role. Um, so it's a very prestigious role uh, if you uh, earn a, a principal data scientist role. But in general, whether it's junior, regular, senior, principal data scientist role, we're talking about people that specialize in building statistical or machine learning models, maybe a neural network, a deep learning model. They specialize in building them, testing them, assessing them, monitoring them, all of the above. That is a data scientist. Now, eventually you might move from an individual contributor role over to some sort of people management role. And uh, oftentimes an analyst might move into either a team lead role or a manager role. Uh, usually a manager is seen as a, a promotion compared to a team lead. And then from a manager role, you might move into a senior manager, a director, a senior director. Now, some companies will have a single analytics org. Other companies will have multiple analytics organizations, uh, marketing, sales. And so the structure and what you're dedicated to if you're a senior manager versus a director, it's going to really depend on the company. From there, especially if they're a data-driven company, there could be some vice president roles available. Sometimes you'll see assistant or senior or executive vice president role, and in some cases, even an officer level role that would report directly into the chief executive officer. Uh, so sometimes you'll see it as chief analytics officer or chief data officer, and that's a really impressive role to get to. Uh, it just has the connotation of being able to drive and handle all things data and analytics related at an organization. There's a lot of opportunities, a lot of different roles available in the analytics career path. If you've looked for an analytics job at all, especially an analyst role, you've probably noticed that these days being an analyst can mean anything. Everybody's an analyst, even if it has nothing to do with data. So pay attention to keywords and skills mentioned in the job description to determine whether it's actually the kind of analyst role that we're talking about today. Look for things in the title, uh, the position title, like data scientist or data engineer. That's obviously a data related analyst. Data analyst is another one. Insights analyst, strategy analyst, sales or marketing analyst is usually a quantitative analyst. Financial analyst, supply chain analyst, all of those are likely to be the type of analyst we're talking about today. But then the other thing you can do to determine if it's the kind of analyst role that we're talking about today is look at the skills that are required in the job description. You want to see things like analytics, uh, SQL, interactive visualization, whether it's Power BI, Tableau, Click, or other interactive visualization tools. If you see Python, R, SAS, or Alteryx, or NIME, it's likely that that's going to be a quantitative analytics role. Uh, also look for data science, statistical analysis, modeling, forecasting, or A-B testing. If you see any of those things in a job posting, it's likely that you're looking at a truly quantitative analytics role. Analytics maturity. At value-driven analytics, 
This is one of our favorite topics because our flagship service, analytics transformation, involves moving an organization from one level of analytics maturity to the next. Now, when we think about analytics maturity, we think about three different levels, level one, level two, and level three. And what we're going to walk through is a general characterization of what a company looks like that's at a level one, two, or three. A level one company are often, not always, small and medium companies, size companies, non-technology companies. And they're using Excel. They might be pulling data via something called the Cube or Analysis Services, certainly not SQL. Uh, they might be using Alteryx or other point and click tools. And they're using those to do point in time descriptive analysis. What are the differences across groups? during a particular time period. They're not doing as much trending analysis, uh, and if they are, it's typically manually pulled and it's not interactive. It's really hard or manual to drill in and see what that trend looks like for a particular business segment or geography. However, one of the pros of working at a level one analytics maturity organization is it's easier to stand out. In fact, you might be able to really do well there by leading that organization to a level two uh, analytics maturity point. So let's talk about what that would look like. What is an analytics level two maturity? Well, a lot of times this is practiced at large corporations, non-technology corporations, again, not always, and the tools that they're using would be things like SQL, an analytics staple, an interactive visualization tool like Power BI or Tableau, maybe some SAS, maybe some R, uh, perhaps some Python. Uh, they might be doing some basic regression, linear regression, logistic regression, and they're using these things to do descriptive analysis. And they are not just looking at it for a point of time, but they're seeing if those trends hold true over time by doing some trending analysis as well. They might be building some basic time series and predictive models occasionally. And one of the nice things about working at a level two analytics maturity organization is it's a great place to learn some accessible yet efficient and flexible analytics. These are building blocks, and especially if you're going to use the type of technologies that are used at a level three organization, you've got to know SQL, you've got to know interactive visualization platforms, uh, some of these basic regression concepts, those are prerequisites. You, you need to know those things. And so that's a great way to start. Now, from there, you could either take that knowledge, go to a level one organization and be that hero that leads them to a level two or level, or you might go to a level three organization and continue to build that technical knowledge, just become a really technical expert. Now, a level three organization is typically seen at a technology company, not always, but just a generalization there. And they're usually using big data SQL platforms or big data platforms in general, even if they're not SQL based platforms that can process billions of rows easily. Uh, they're probably using Python, Spark. They're not just building regression models, but also machine learning models and even neural networks and deep learning models, some of the most advanced machine learning models out there. Uh, and they're probably using version control when they build those models. They probably have a good model maintenance and uh, continual assessment process, really good, robust analytics processes in place. And they're using those things to perform classification determining which customers are going to buy prescription, uh, pres building prescriptive analysis and models to determine what your biggest drivers of sales are, for instance, A-B testing everything. A level three maturity level organization is going to be very data driven. It's got to be tested if it's going to be rolled out. And one of the benefits of working in an organization like this, is there's a lot of next level analytics being done, which is really exciting. And you're able to learn some really advanced uh, techniques from the analysts there. Now, sometimes when you're building these more advanced models, it doesn't have to be the case, but it tends to be the case that the projects might take a little bit longer to roll out. 
Um, and it's going to be a little harder to stand out as an analyst, but that's okay. It's a great place to learn. So hopefully that's helpful for understanding the three different levels of analytics maturity. If you're already with an organization and you've experienced what analytics is like where you work today, you may be curious of what level of analytics maturity your current organization is at. And if so, we've got the perfect tool for you on valuedrivenanalytics.com. So if you head on over to the website, there'll be this orange banner up here that'll allow you to take the analytics transformation assessment. Go ahead and click on that blue button, take assessment, and it'll take you to this page where you'll see a quiz. And it'll have a series of about 34 questions and each one has three possible answers. Just fill out each of those, submit the form, and within a few days, you will receive an email with a customized report of what level of analytics maturity your organization is at, and more importantly, how you can help your organization get to the next level. So check it out. Regardless of what type of organization you work for, there are different types of an analytics projects that you might work on. Uh, the first type is building a report or a dashboard, especially uh, an interactive dashboard, but some are still done in Excel. And there are some roles, such as a reporting analyst, where they spend 100% of their time on building and maintaining reports and dashboards. One of the benefits of building dashboards, one of the things I enjoy about it, is it can be fun to build aesthetically pleasing dashboards. It's one of the closest things to being an artist uh, that an analyst gets to do. The other thing that's nice about this, even if you're a data scientist, is that dashboards can be implementation vehicles for an analytical project. You can't just build a model and give your code to a salesperson. You've got to deliver it to them somehow and taking the resulting scores from your model and putting them into some kind of an interactive visualization tool that a salesperson could interact with is a great way to implement your model. Another type of project an analyst might work on is a simple ad hoc data pool. Now, it can be gratifying occasionally to help satisfy an immediate need of a stakeholder, especially someone who really wants to help people. However, if you get too many of these too often, it can be monotonous uh, to do this. And so I would recommend that if you get a recurring request for ad hoc data, then it's probably time to build an interactive visualization tool where the stakeholder or stakeholders can go themselves and pull that data. Another type of project is performing ad hoc analysis. One thing that I like about ad hoc analysis, it's not always the most technical or challenging, although it can be. Uh, sometimes there's a fine line between an ad hoc analysis and a model build. They can go together in some cases. But even if it's not an advanced data science model that you're building and it's not as advanced of an analysis, usually that ad hoc analysis is being done to tackle an immediate challenge that it can benefit right away. Uh, so it can, again, can be gratifying to see an immediate impact that your analysis has. We need this analysis done in two or three days so that we can make this decision versus models, they don't have to, but often do take months to build and implement. And so you don't get to see the fruit or benefit quite as quickly. And that brings us to our last type of project, which is building a data science model. Now, going back to the roles, sometimes a uh, organization will assign the building of the modeling data set to a data engineer role and the building of the model and the testing of the model to a data scientist role. In other cases, the data scientist does all of that. And they don't use the term data engineer at those organizations. This often involves applying advanced techniques to accomplish some pretty impressive feats, predicting things or explaining things. It's 
really pretty neat to be able to to do that um, and it does require oftentimes some sophisticated models but you don't have to be a math major to do this stuff now the downside again as i said it doesn't have to be this way but oftentimes it is this way it can take a long time to implement this um, now in terms of all these projects uh, you can see that there are certain times where a reporting analyst would work on the dashboards. An analyst would do the ad hoc data pools and the ad hoc analysis, and then a data engineer and a data scientist would work on the models. But every team is different. Some analytics roles and teams specialize in one or a few of these. We're the data science team. We're the reporting team. We're the analytics team. Well, other roles span all of them. And there are some projects that whether it's one analyst working on all the parts or a divide and conquer, a team approach, they require a little bit of both. Imagine a project where a data science model needs to be built. We talked about how it could be implemented in an interactive visualization tool. And then perhaps there's an ad hoc analysis, maybe an A-B test that needs to be conducted to see if that model is better than the old model or system that the team was using. So in a lot of projects, multiple forms of uh, these analysis techniques can be used. Keep that in mind. Now, again, there can also be roles that you get to work on a variety of these. Some days, some weeks, you're working on dashboards. Other times you're doing ad hoc analysis and sometimes you're building models. I found that a lot of analysts actually enjoy the variety of projects uh, that comes with a role like that, although there certainly are some that prefer to specialize in reporting or data science. Let's take a look at a typical day or a typical project for an analyst. In one case, a stakeholder might reach out and they might require a simple ad hoc data pool like we were talking about in the last slide. And in that case, especially at a level uh, two or three analytics maturity organization, they may uh, perhaps write a SQL query to pull the data from the database and simply copy the results, uh, the resulting data into an Excel workbook. And a recommended thing to do is to also create a tab in the workbook, uh, name the tab SQL and put your code there. Just in case you ever need to pull the same thing again, the code will be very convenient right there for you or someone else that it gets forwarded to. So you'd put together that Excel workbook and then you'd email it back to the stakeholder. That's a very common process for satisfying an ad hoc data request. Now, in other cases, you might have a stakeholder that needs some kind of a model build. And your first step, or again, it could be a data engineer you're working with, would be writing a SQL query to build that modeling data set. You could be embedding that SQL query directly in a Python job, pulls the data into a, a data frame or a data table, and ultimately builds a model in Python, tests it out, gets comfortable with it, and then rolls it out in an interactive visualization platform like Power BI, at which point the stakeholder can view the scores that your model has created. And in some cases, you could even use that Power BI dashboard or interactive visualization to present the insights from the model. Again, this is an example of how multiple techniques come together for a single request. At the end of the day, we're trying to satisfy and solve business challenges, and we will use whatever technique makes sense for the situation, in some cases, combining them together, as in the second example here. Now let's talk about what skills you're going to need to be a high performing analyst. And first on the list is an analytical thought process. When we talk about an analytical thought process, we're talking about a general affinity for math, not necessarily calculus or trigonometry formulas, but the kind of math that allows you to take a business challenge and turn it into an analytics approach that is rigorous, robust, however you want to say it. Uh, word problems in math tend to be a, a good example of this, uh, translating a situation, a few numbers, into an equation that can be solved and be able to explain exactly what the right decision is. Well, after that, I would say attention to detail is extremely important. 
as an analyst, you need to double check your work or triple check your work, whether it's your code or your Power BI file, whatever it is that's being presented, make sure it's accurate. Uh, doing sanity checks is a really good way to maintain a good attention to detail. What that means is basically stepping back and thinking, would a reasonable per person expect this to be the case? Uh, if not, it could be that you've come across something very surprising, and that's great. That's why you do the analysis. But if it is very surprising, you definitely want to double, triple, quadruple check it to make sure there's not something else going on. And then a great option as well is to validate against other sources. If you're pulling some data and there's a report out there that has the same data, there's probably some way you can validate against it and make sure the two generally match up. All good ways to maintain good attention to detail. And this is critical because if your stakeholders come to uh, notice errors or uh, there's been attention to detail issues in the past, they're less likely to use your analysis to make decisions in the future. Then there's communication. This can be a real differentiator for you as an analyst. There are a lot of analysts who do a great job with the analysis, but then perhaps in their communication, they might get too technical to in the weeds is very common. And the stakeholder doesn't really get what they need out of it to make a, a data-based decision. Now, an analyst who can take a step back and really, if anything, explain the high level aspects of the methodology in a way a non-technical stakeholder can understand, but then really focuses on the insights and even more so the recommendations that come outside of that, that come from that analysis. That is a good analytics communicator right there. So focus on the recommendations rather than how you got there. If you're going to be an efficient analyst, I would highly recommend investing in learning how to code in analytics languages. These tend to be languages that are easy to learn. It's things like SQL and Python, um, R, SAS, or a few other options. This is going to dramatically increase your productivity because your code can work for you. You can schedule it and it's getting things done. It's sending out reports instead of you having to do that. And it's all automated. It also increases your flexibility. Uh, no more, well, this point and click tool doesn't have that option. Now, if you can dream it, you can code it. So there's a lot of flexibility there. And all, while you can create data science models from a point and click perspective and Excel or other tools, you'll have so much more flexibility and be able to do so much more with building your data science model if you do it in a coding platform like Python, R, or SAS. Well, a lot of people don't think about analytics as a creative career path, but it so can be in so many ways. When you're designing an interactive dashboard, you've got to have a good eye for layout. But even more so, I would say the creativity comes in every day when you take a business challenge and creatively come up with a way that you could use analytics to address it and craft an approach that is perfect for that business use case. A lot of people um, don't necessarily think about analysts as leaders, and I think a lot of it comes to the uh, fact that many analysts struggle with communication, keeping it high level. They want to get in the weeds, which creates a barrier with executives, or it can. Uh, but analysts make great leaders, especially if an organization is committed to making data-driven decisions. Who better to make robust data-driven decisions than an analyst? Um, now, as an analyst, even as an individual contributor, you can be a leader. You can proactively look for analyses, projects, even leadership initiatives, anything that stands out as a way that your organization can uh, improve. You can be the one to make that improvement and to lead that change. And if you do that enough and you do that well enough, Pretty soon, your organization is going to start seeing you as a leader, and that could open up some more formal career opportunities. Project management is also important. Uh, stakeholders want an analyst who they can rely on 
to get a certain analytics deliverable, a data pool, a dashboard, a model build in the timeline that they commit to. Uh, so being a good project manager and being able to manage usually multiple analytics projects at the same time is expected and it's important. And similarly, sometimes you'll get, in fact, oftentimes as an analyst, everybody wants data these days. Everyone wants their analytics project. So you'll often find yourself in a situation where there's more requests than time to complete the request. And that's where you've got to be a good prioritizer. You've got to remind stakeholders what's on your plate and help them prioritize. And hopefully everyone will agree to prioritize the projects that would seem to drive the most value. A lot of times uh, you'll get a lot of nice to know requests, but not necessarily need to know. And so you can work with your stakeholders to make sure those need to know, know requests uh, get prioritized, the ones that are actually going to potentially change the decision that would be made depending on your analysis. Lastly, and this is important for any type of role, is you've got to have a solid work ethic, especially as you're learning analytics, but even beyond. You're going to run into coding errors. It's just a fact of life if you're coding as an analyst. Uh, and unexpected results, which is where the sanity checks come in, and sometimes when you run into those, it requires persistence to find a solution. So work ethic is so important. These are just, I would say, the main skills that are required to be a high performing analyst. Well, a lot of analysts are extremely passionate about the tools they use. And that's what we're going to talk about next. We're going to look at tools used for a few different aspects of being an analyst, data manipulation, interactive visualization, data science, and what you use to present your, your work. In terms of data manipulation, as I mentioned earlier, Excel has been a staple for years for more manual data manipulation. There are also some point and click tools. Uh, Alteryx uh, does come with a licensing cost, but it's a point and click tool. There is the ability to code within it as well. Nime is a an open source, perhaps, uh, or it's at least free alternative that's also point and click, similar to Alteryx in a lot of ways. SQL is an analytics staple. It is a coding language, but it is one of the simplest coding languages you can learn, and it's extremely useful for data manipulation, merging tables together, creating columns, filtering data, all in an automated way. That's one we're going to look at uh, in deeper detail. SAS is probably one of the original advanced analytics platforms. It's been around for years. Um, it is, uh, does cost money for the license versus there are some other advanced analytics open source solutions like R and like Python that we're going to really dive into as well. All of those can be used for data manipulation. SQL, SAS, R, Python are your coding options that I would generally recommend pursuing. And then Excel uh, is your most manual of, of all of them uh, from a data manipulation perspective. In terms of interactive visualization, these tools have become really popular over the last 10, 15 years. Power BI has become an extremely popular option. And we're gonna do a, a deep dive on Power BI in a specific session. Tableau has been a long, around for a long time. Uh, they've been a staple in the industry for a while. That's uh, power between Power BI and Tableau. Those are your two major platforms. But there's also platforms like Click or MicroStrategy. SAS has their Visual Studio, and all of these have a at least a paid version that most companies would be using. Uh, interactive visualization tool. It's typically not free. When it comes to data science, you can build your model in several platforms. These are just a few. Python has become a very popular choice, as well as R for statistical models. And SAS, again, has been around for a while. People have building, been building models in SAS for a long time. That does typically require a licensing fee. Well, Python and R are open source. And then even in NIME, Alteryx, and even Excel, there are options to build models. But I would highly recommend Python, R, and SAS for the flexibility they provide. 
when it comes time to present your work, the standard, as it is in many professions, is to build a PowerPoint presentation with your findings. However, it can be especially efficient and perhaps engaging to actually take your visualization and Power BI or Tableau and use that as your presentation and drill into trends live before your stakeholders. One side benefit, benefit of this is it also acts as a training session to show your stakeholders how they can dive into these trends as well. Let's get into data manipulation. We're gonna start our journey in data manipulation off with one of the most popular data manipulation tools, Excel. In Excel, you essentially have a set of worksheets, uh, a workbook or file that has a set of worksheets, and each worksheet is essentially a, a data table, or it could be composed of multiple uh, tables, but it's a set of rows and columns. It's a very simple concept that a lot of us take for granted. We've just gotten used to using it so many times. A worksheet can have multiple tables or charts, as we said. This is a Microsoft tool, and so most organizations purchase an Excel license for most employees, and it's been around for a long time. It does provide a fairly flexible means of data manipulation, but that data manipulation is mainly being done by point and clicking. Uh, it makes, the, as a result of it being based on point and click, it makes building a, an Excel workbook a little repetitive uh, not as efficient as coding tools, but it is one of the easiest analytics tools to learn, which is probably why it's so popular. If you want to do advanced data manipulation, oftentimes an analyst has to jump through hoops. It's, it's not as straightforward as it would be maybe with other coding languages like SQL and Python. However, uh, some analysts will learn VBA uh, and create macros to automate some of the data manipulation to some extent. This uh, is one of the tools of choice, I would say, especially for financial analysts and supply chain analysts in general. That's a generalization. And sometimes even your regular analytics analyst, uh, marketing analyst, or sales analyst, especially if they're at a level one analytics maturity organization. When uh, an analyst creates a workbook, a lot of times it gets emailed out. Um, sometimes analysts will create a Python job or um, a process in another analytics tool that will automate that emailing out of an Excel workbook, which if you're going to use Excel, that's a more efficient way to use it. But once those Excel workbooks are emailed out, usually the recipient has a limited ability to interact with the data like they um, they wouldn't be able to interact with it to the same extent they would with an interactive visualization tool like Power BI or Tableau. But there are some Excel features that the analyst could use to make this possible. Uh, there's pivot tables, there is the ability to create slicers in Excel that's not done as often, but there are some options out there. Excel workbooks tend to mainly be used for data, data exploration and analysis. Uh, it's very quick to pull data into Excel and manipulate it, so it often gets used for that quick analysis, especially even at the higher uh, analytics maturity level organizations. It's rarely used to create data science models, but there is the possibility to create regression models and statistical tests with either Excel add-ons or certain functions in Excel. Now, where Excel really excels is building spreadsheets where cells and inputs can be changed, and then the linked cells, results, or models will automatically update, especially something like a financial forecasting model or a budget model. It's hard to beat Excel for a financial model. Let's take a look at an example Excel workbook. Uh, this is a worksheet within a workbook, but you can see there's an example of a graph here, a table here, and all of this is very easy to set up, and we'll go into how to do that in our next training session. Let's talk about another data manipulation tool, a point-and-click tool called Alteryx. Alteryx is comprised of 
two different versions, a designer version that an analyst would use to actually create a workflow and a gallery version that's online that an analyst would use to publish the workflow, schedule it, and publish and access applications. A workflow is made up of chains of different types of data manipulation nodes or blocks. Uh, the, each one represents different something different, like selecting data, filtering data. These workflows are created through the point-and-click designer application. And one of the unique features about Alteryx is this idea of creating an app in the online gallery version. An application essentially asks for inputs from a user, from a stakeholder, It'll run the workflow, the set of blocks in the background, and then it will return the processed result back to the user in the application window in their browser. It's very simple, and it's a great option for automating common tasks that always have slightly different inputs. Alteryx is a popular tool for analysts who want to avoid coding. It does have the ability to write Python code and SQL code in it, which is great, but a lot of people use it to avoid coding. But at the same time, even though they're not coding, they do have the option to automate the data manipulation by putting their workflow on a schedule. This is really popular, especially for level one and level two analytics maturity organizations. It's not as popular as other options like Excel, SQL, and Python. It does have a licensing cost that is not insignificant, but it's um, fairly flexible data manipulation. Not as flexible as coding generally, but still fairly flexible. Again, you can you can get that flexibility with the Python and SQL um, modules within Alteryx. Similar to Excel, the setup of the nodes, since it's done via point and click, can get a little repetitive, a little manual. So it's not quite as efficient as coding options, in my opinion. But one benefit compared to Excel is that after initially coding the workflow, it's really easy to automate the workflow on a schedule in the gallery. Uh, similar to Excel, a lot of times analysts have to go through a, a little more than what's necessary, jump through hoops and perform many steps to do more advanced data manipulation, in my opinion. Alteryx workflows can be used to create curated data sets, data sets that are refined to the interest of the team using them, to email out reports, or to automate manual requests. Some analysts might use uh, Alteryx for data exploration analysis, and it seems to be, in my experience, less often used to create data science models, but it is possible. Let's take a look at a few specific screenshots of Alteryx. So here is Alteryx Designer, where you'd actually build your workflow. These are different nodes or blocks that are strung together. It shows the order. You'd start with this one, maybe import some data, select data, merge data together, and so forth. After designing this in, in Designer, you would publish your workflow to Alteryx Gallery, which is online, and this is where you could schedule it, or set it up as an application where your stakeholders could go and, and run a workflow that you've created for them. And that's Alteryx at a high level. Let's talk about NIME. NIME is another point and click node-based tool. It's a set of nodes that are strung together, as you can see here, to create a data manipulation process. And it's all done via point and click. It is free. Uh, but it, even though it's free, it doesn't seem to be as popular as Alteryx. It is somewhat popular for building data science models in a very visual way, which is one benefit of it. It tends to get especially a lot of use for data science by junior data scientists. More senior data scientists would tend to use a coding platform like Python, but it could be used by some more senior data scientists as well. Again, it has a great way of laying out the data science process um, perhaps even more visual than, um, than what's possible with code. When you look at the popularity of Alteryx versus NIME to point and click block based analytics tools, it's very clear that Alteryx is more popular, at least in terms of Google searches, uh, than NIME. So to me, NIME is a best kept secret out there when it comes to point-and-click block-based data manipulation. 
So if you're looking for an open source, a free block-based tool, give Nime a shot. SQL, an analytics staple. Uh, SQL is essentially a coding language, uh, usually written as a query. It can be used to create tables as well, but a SQL query is made up of several statements that specify which data to pull, what tables to pull that data from, and how to organize that data. In the end, running a SQL returns a table of rows and columns similar to a worksheet in an Excel workbook. Uh, the, or, there are different parts of a SQL query, like the SELECT statement, the FROM statement, WHERE statement, GROUP BY, ORDER BY, and more. And we'll get into those when we look at uh, the SQL session. For analysts and data scientists, especially at a level 2 or level 3 analytics maturity organization, again, SQL is truly a staple for data manipulation. And the proof of that is the fact that nearly every analytics platform has an option to write SQL code inside of it. That's true for Altrix, SAS, R, Python, Tableau, Power BI, and more. Now there are several different variations, slight variations of SQL, but the basic components like the select statement, the from statement, the group by the statement are the same across all of them just slight variations in things like date syntax and other aspects. Now, SQL's traditionally been ran on-premises at a company, and platforms like Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, Teradata, and others. But over the last 10 years, big data cloud platforms have created their own versions of SQL, such as Snowflake, HiveQL, and others. This allows an analyst to use cloud computing to apply traditional SQL data manipulation, the same select from group by statements analysts are used to, in a way that can process billions of rows within seconds. It's quite impressive. I would say SQL is especially good at aggregating and grouping data. Nothing does aggregation like SQL does. It's also really good at joining tables together in a flexible way and creating uh, custom columns. You know, in terms of data manipulation, SQL is very flexible. Uh, although, in certain cases, when it comes to looping through data, platforms like Python, R, and SAS are perhaps even more flexible. But again, SAS can be actually ran, SQL can actually be ran within those platforms. Now, once a SQL is, query is written, it's normally used to pull some data, maybe one time, or scheduled another platform to run on a regular basis uh, at a stakeholder's schedule or whenever on demand. <laughs> it's uh, very helpful for automation. When it comes to one-time data pools, uh, if you were to get an ad hoc data request, it's very likely that an analyst would go into a SQL platform like Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio, run the SQL query, copy and paste the results into an Excel workbook. And my recommendation would be to create a SQL tab as well that you copy over your SQL query there so it's all in one place, the same workbook, and then email that out to the stakeholder. SQL is often used for data manipulation, maybe some analysis as well. Most data science models, with the exception of things like market basket analysis, can't be used to create, um, most data science models cannot uh, be created in SQL. But SQL is extremely helpful in creating the starting modeling data set for a data science model. So it is important, especially for the data engineering work involved with building a model, but it's not typically gonna be used to actually run the modeling algorithm like regression or decision trees or random forest. Here's an example of a very popular SQL platform called Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. And this is set up very similar to other SQL platforms where you can explore databases and data tables on the left in an object explorer. In the top section here, you can actually write your SQL statement. You have a select statement, a from statement, and group by statements, and so forth that we'll learn more about. 
And essentially, you write the SQL query, press execute, which runs a SQL query, and eventually it'll result in a data table, a set of rows and columns, and you can copy that data to Excel or wherever it needs to go from there, or embed the SQL query in an interactive visualization platform or in Python or SAS or any of the other analytics tools that have a SQL integration. Now, SAS is what I would call an advanced analytics tool. It can be used for data manipulation, but it's frequently used for statistical analysis and building data science models. And SAS also has an interactive dashboarding tool called SAS Visual Studio. This is one of the first and primary analytics platforms available in the 20th century. It was built at NC State by Jim Goodnight and John Saul in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. It's been around for a while, but it has been declining in popularity over the last 10 to 20 years as open source alternatives like R and Python have become available. The cost of a SaaS license is not insignificant, and so a, a lot of analysts have opted for the open source free version of advanced data manipulation. SAS does have integrations with SQL and also even R and Python now, which is very convenient. It tends to be especially popular in the medical and banking industries, probably in part to the fact that regulators have historically had a, a preference for SAS data set formats in these industries. And the company is based in Cary, North Carolina. At the bottom of the screen here, we have an example of code written. I believe this would be in base SAS. And as you uh, probably can't see the details here, but SAS coding tends to use a lot of different types of procedures, uh, proc statements. But that's your overview of SAS. Similar to SAS, R is a flexible analytics coding language that can be used for data manipulation and also statistical analysis and building data science models. But unlike SAS, R is open source and free. <laughs> the R languages is usually coded out and ran in an IDE, an integrated development environment. And the most popular IDE for R is RStudio, but there are others as well out there. R ha also has an online reporting tool called Shining R, which, Shiny R, which is worth checking out. R uses packages that are full of functions for various types of data manipulations and actions. There's packages for regression and different types of data science models and all kinds of data manipulation functions. Now, R has historically been the statistician's preferred SAS alternative, more so than Python. But that seems to be changing as more and more data science algorithms have been created in Python and often in a more computationally efficient manner than in R. That's a generalization. At the bottom here, we have an example of RStudio where you can see the coding window, the console, uh, some variable definitions at the top right, and uh, some examples of output in the bottom right. It's a neat setup, uh, a neat IDE setup, where you, each part of the screen has its purpose. And then there was Python. This is a topic that we're going to dive deep into in a specific uh, session on Python. Similar to SAS and R, but even more so as a general purpose language, Python is a flexible coding language that can be used for data manipulation. It's frequently used for statistical analysis and building data science models as well, but it can even be used for developing websites and applications and even video games. Similar to R, Python is open source and free, and also similar to R, the Python language is usually coded out and ran in an IDE. The most popular IDE for Python, though, seems to be a Jupyter Notebook, but there are other IDEs as well for Python. A Jupyter Notebook has multiple code cells, and the output, which might be a table or a chart, a pandas data frame, a variable value, model output, the, the output from that code cell appears directly under each code cell. It's a very interactive experience coding in Jupyter in a Jupyter Notebook. 
Similar to R, Python also uses packages that are full of functions for various types of data manipulations and actions. Anaconda is a very popular distribution for Python. It includes the Python executor, the thing that actually executes, runs the code, common Python packages, sets of, uh, sets of uh, functions, <laughs> and the Jupyter Notebook uh, IDE, as well as several other IDEs as well. Python has historically been the coder or the programmer's preferred SAS alternative, more so than R, which I think has led to its algorithms and functions being generally more computation, computationally efficient than R. As I said before, that's a generalization. This is an example of a Jupyter Notebook. At the top, we have the title, and you'll see it's made up of multiple coding cells. Each of these is a coding cell, and beneath that coding cell would be any output from that coding cell. Again, a very interactive experience coding in Python in Jupyter Notebooks. Now we're looking at Google Trends to get a sense of how popular these tools are, at least based on Google searches. You'll see overall Alteryx is uh, tends to have less searches than the uh, other tools here, Python and SAS. Now, R is hard to get a read on because it's a letter, <laughs> so we don't have R shown here. But what you'll see is SAS's uh, popularity has declined over time in terms of Google searches, and Python's popularity has really increased quickly since about 2010. It's become a very popular tool for analytics. Now, this is Python in general, which again can be used for things beyond analytics. Let's talk about interactive visualization tools like Power BI, Tableau, Click, MicroStrategy, and SAS Visual Studio. As we said before, all of these generally have some form of uh, paid version, but sometimes in certain ways for certain use cases, you can use them for free. Power BI is the dashboard tool that we're going to have a dedicated session for. I'm excited for that. It's not quite as common as Excel, but as a Microsoft tool that's added more and more functionality, Power BI has become just as popular as a tool like Tableau in terms of Google searches, and it has the momentum. It's been increasing in Google searches for a while. We'll see a graph of that coming up. Similar to Alteryx, there's a desktop version for designing dashboards that is ultimately used to publish to an online version where the dashboard is normally viewed by stakeholders. Now, downloading the desktop version of Power BI is free. And technically, this it's a .pbix file can be sent via email to others. And as long as they've downloaded the free Power BI desktop software as well, the recipient will be able to open, view, and interact with the dashboard in Power BI Desktop. But it's much more convenient for the dashboard creator to simply publish to Power BI Online and schedule it and send stakeholders a web link where they can always see the latest data. That's typically how it's used. This is where the cost comes in, though. It's a little less than the cost of Tableau, uh, and it is often paid in the organization's E5 Microsoft license if the organization has that level of licensing, it's included. Similar to Excel, Power BI Dashboard or Workbook can have multiple tabs. Um, uh, it, uh, each tab can have different visuals, such as charts, tables, cards, slicers, and filters to interact with your data. Um, creating a dashboard, it usually starts with importing data and then design, uh, designating table relationships if there are multiple tables uh, in the dashboard, then creating calculated columns or measures, uh, uses DAX for that, similar to Excel syntax, uh, and then creating visuals, which could include charts and tables and cards and slicers and filters. Uh, then once the analyst feels good about the dashboard, they would publish it online and they would schedule automated updates. It's fairly flexible data manipulation. Um, and in terms of features, Microsoft, at least for a while, was adding features monthly, which allowed it to catch up to Tableau in terms of functionality very quickly. 
dashboards are created via point and click, but updates are ultimately automated and scheduled. The big benefit of a tool like Power BI compared to doing reporting in Excel is that stakeholders, recipients, can easily drill into the data. And what that means is there's going to be less manual back and forth, um, and it increases flexibility for the analyst and the stakeholder. If they need to see it for a particular geography, as long as the Power BI dashboard has been set up with geographical slicers and filters, which normally uh, an analyst will design a dashboard to have drill down capability, to have filters, slicers available, then the stakeholder doesn't need to put in an extra request with the analyst to get a version of it for a particular geography. They can do that themselves. That's called self-service reporting. Dashboards are often used to monitor trends. So oftentimes you'll see a overtime chart in a dashboard. Uh, if not, it's a, it's a great thing to include. Here's an example of a screenshot of a Power BI desktop. This is where you build the dashboard. And again, eventually you will publish that dashboard online and schedule it. And this is where your stakeholders would view it uh, simply by accessing a link that you would send to them. Let's talk about Tableau. Tableau was the original interactive dashboarding tool, and it was previously quite dominant. But Power BI, again, seems to have really caught up with it in the last few months. Tableau was purchased by Salesforce.com several years ago. Similar to Power BI, there's a desktop version used to design dashboards that is ultimately used to publish to an online server version where the dashboard is viewed. Now, Tableau is generally more expensive than Power BI. Rather than the desktop version being free, like it is in Power BI, the desktop developer version actually costs more than the viewer license in Tableau. Uh, Tableau report can have multiple dashboards, which are made up of multiple worksheets. A worksheet is essentially a single visual, like a chart, a table, a card, with an optional title and slicers, filters that might have been added to it. One of the downsides of Tableau is that most data visuals cannot be created directly on the dashboard, but have to be created as a worksheet first and then brought into a dashboard. Compared to Power BI, that leads to more steps being needed in order to create a dashboard often. With Power BI, you can create those tables and charts directly within the dashboard. That's a nice thing about Power BI, in my opinion. Creating a dashboard usually starts with importing data, similar to Power BI, creating calculated columns. Now these will be slightly different syntax than what you'd have in Excel. Uh, it won't be as similar as DAX is, for instance, in Power BI. And then you'd create worksheets, which would be charts, tables, cards, and then drag those. This is the extra step in Tableau, drag those worksheets onto a dashboard and, and format them rather than creating those directly on the dashboard. Similar to Power BI, then you'd publish it and schedule uh, automated updates. Tableau, similar to Power BI, has flexible data manipulation, but there are some cases, in my opinion, where you kind of have to jump through hoops to create specialized, unique visualizations. Uh, compare creating a waterfall chart in Power BI versus Tableau. And at least for me, I, I find it much easier to do that in Power BI. Similar to Power BI, dashboards are created via point and click, and then ultimately the refresh of the data is automated, scheduled in the online version. Here is an example of a pretty nice looking Tableau dashboard. Uh, you'll see similar to Power BI, you've got some graphs, a map here, uh, perhaps that doesn't, there may be some filters, um, yep, up here. And that's an example of a Tableau dashboard. Now, in terms of popularity, uh, this is very interesting. This is a fascinating trend in the analytics industry. You'll notice that Tableau, wow, they came out of the gate. They've been the most popular interactive visualization tool for a long time. You can see that here in blue, but look at this. Uh, starting you know, in the mid 2010s, Power BI comes in and ramps up extremely quickly. And in the last few months, 
there have actually been more Google uh, Google searches for Power BI than Tableau. Can't you just imagine the folks at Microsoft throwing a big party <laughs> right around here? Uh, Click is a, another somewhat common interactive visualization tool, but you can see that for the entire time period here, Click has had far fewer uh, Google searches and then Tableau especially, and at this point, Power BI too. So that gives you a sense for how popular, the, popular these tools are. Now, with all of the tools that we've talked about, if you know one tool in that area, like if you know one interactive visualization tool or one at least coding data manipulation tool, learning another one becomes a lot easier than certainly learning the first interactive visualization tool that you did or the first coding data manipulation tool. So if you can just learn one tool in each area and master that, if you're applying for a role that maybe uses Tableau and you've used Power BI in the past, learning Tableau should be a very easy process. So don't let that get in the way if you're not familiar with the tool um, that a particular company is using. Usually most companies understand that as well and they've seen that to be the case. Let's talk about some common analytics techniques that analysts use. The first thing you do in a project often is to determine what the right tables to use are. It might be that you've worked with them in the past or you have to ask someone else about what tables, where certain data lives. And it's important to then understand what that table represents and validate that, especially answering the question, what does one row represent in this table? It's important to avoid duplicate issues. Then you might need to manipulate that data in the table that you're in, determine which columns to select. Uh, maybe you need to create some columns. What rows need to be filtered and what tables need to be brought together in order to get the ultimate table that you'll use for your analysis. Interactive dashboarding is another popular technique that we've talked about as we went through Power BI and Tableau as a couple of dashboarding examples, but that involves importing data into an interactive visualization platform, creating interactive filters, cards, tables, and charts, designing your dashboard, and ultimately publishing it. Another data manipulation technique is aggregating or grouping. SQL does this really well. This involves rolling up totals to compare across the different values of a column, aggregating data together. Trending is a very important thing to do. You don't want to just look at a comparison for over an entire time period and not consider how that might be changing over time. So monitoring a certain metric by week, by month, by quarter, by year, uh, and how that is potentially changing over time is extremely important. Performing statistical analysis is a critical skill that especially a data scientist is expected to be able to do. Uh, you might conduct a t-test to assess whether there's a statistical significance across two groups. Uh, it's one thing to just look at how different two groups are. It's another thing to determine whether that's potentially just due to random chance or actually statistically significant. When it comes to data science models, uh, data scientists need to have that skill. Uh, they need to be able to build models that either predict something into the future, maybe which customer is going to buy or which customer has a higher likelihood of buying or what sales will be for the next five months or prescribe an impact. What is the impact of this variable on this other variable? Data science modeling is a great technique for accomplishing that. And then there's A-B testing. This is the best way to determine the value that a certain treatment or initiative is driving. It involves randomly assigning observations, which could be people or products or geographies, but randomly selecting ob observations to belong to a test group, which will receive a certain treatment or initiative, and a control group, which will not. And by randomly assigning observations to each group, the only thing that is different across the groups in aggregate is the fact that the test group received a treatment, which means that any differences across the test and control group in the metric you're trying to measure can be ascribed to the uh, 
to the treatment itself. And then you can use a statistical analysis like a t-test to determine whether that difference is statistically significant. That's an example of how these different techniques, and this is certainly not all of the techniques an analyst would use, but these are several techniques that can be used in isolation or together to ultimately accomplish an analysis objective. Let's dive into each one of these. Exploring data. Exploring data involves finding and understanding a specific data table. And a data table is simply made up of a set of rows and a set of columns. We have an example over here. This would be a table that is one row per month product combination with the number of sales that occurred for that particular month product combination. It's a set of rows and a set of columns. Simple as that. Now, when you begin an analysis, especially if you're at a new company or you're working on an area that you haven't done much analysis in in the past, you may need to go to another analyst or the business intelligence or IT team to ask for access to a table to find out what the table is called, uh, where the information that you're looking for resides. And you may even be able to get a starting SQL query uh, from them, which might have some common filters that should be considered. Uh, perhaps the most popular columns or the key columns that you might want to start selecting. It can give you a great hint of where to start if you can get a SQL query. And of course, ask some clarification questions. Now, it is absolutely critical that you understand for every data table you're using this key question. And that is, what does one row represent in this table? In our table on the right here, you can see that there is one row for every month product combination. Other tables might be one row per product, one row per month, one row per sale, one row per customer, but you need to, one, answer that question, and two, validate that that's the case. And we'll eventually, when we get into SQL, talk about how you can validate what one row represents in that table. But if you can't answer that question, or maybe you have an idea of what one row represents, but that's not actually what one row represents, you can easily run into duplicate issues, and that's where attention to detail can fall apart. Let's talk about data manipulation, and especially data manipulation in SQL, which I highly, highly recommend learning. And we'll have a dedicated session to that. Let's just go over some of the basics of SQL for now. First, there's a select statement. This identifies which columns to include in the resulting data table. We're ultimately writing a SQL query that will run. We saw an example of that in SQL Server Management Studio in the SQL, brief SQL section we covered. Uh, it starts with a select statement that covers what you want to pull. And in some cases, you can even define a new calculation. This is an example where we're taking the sales variable and the existing price variable, multiplying them together to create a new revenue variable. That'll be an extra column in our data set. We use variable and column interchangeably. We need to specify in a SQL query which table the information will come from. In this case, it's we're starting with one called sales table. And then in the next line, we're actually joining that with another table, and we specify how to join those tables. We want to join the rows in the first table uh, with the rows in the second table where the value within each table's product column matches. This isn't optional, but in a lot of cases, you'll want to have a where statement that filters the results to a certain requirement. In this case, we're only going to return rows where the product column from the sales table equals apples. We're not going to include those orange rows. <laughs> and then oftentimes in a SQL query, not always, you'll have an order by statement that tells you how to order the data. Now there are other SQL clauses as well, uh, optional, but this SQL query would run and it would return a data set that has for all the rows where product equals apples, the month, the price, the sales, and the revenue column. Again, it's absolutely critical to answer the question uh, of for the tables you're pulling from and the table that you're about to create with the SQL query, what does one row represent and validate that that's the case. Okay, same data set, but now we've brought it into an interactive dashboard. 
In particular, we have created a title, we have some slicers on the side that we can essentially use to click and filter down to just apples or just oranges or all of the above if we select all. We can filter on certain months using this month filter we've created. And we've created a table here that has three columns. We could create charts in addition. You can see I've used some conditional formatting bars in the background of sales here. Just a way to visualize how sales have uh, been changing by month, by product. There are lots of other ways we could visualize as well. Um, and the idea is that if we use these slicers, it'll filter down this table and any other visualizations that we'd created as well. So we create this after importing the data, perhaps using a SQL query in a platform like Power BI. And after we've created it, we would publish it and make it available via a link to our stakeholders. And now they can interact with it and see the latest data whenever they need to. No manual work involved. Now let's talk about aggregating and grouping. And I don't think there's a better tool to do that than SQL. Here's an example of a SQL query that aggregates sales by product. You can see we're using an aggregation function in SQL. This is sum. You can also use things like count and min and average, uh, but we are summing sales and we're summing them by product. And this is key. We are grouping by product. That allows us to have the following output. This is what we might see in either Power BI or uh, perhaps SQL Server Management Studio, whatever engine we're running our SQL query in. Now we just get two rows, one per product. And what it's done is it's compressed all the rows for apples, all the rows for oranges, all the rows for each value within the column that you are grouping by. It's all boiled down to one row now that in this case is the sum of sales. And it shows us at a high level uh, what the sum of apples and oranges are over this time period. Really neat. Now, before we saw that there were more apple sales than orange sales over our entire time period, January 2022 to the beginning of 2023. But it's also a good idea to check if that difference has always been the case. And that's where trending comes into play. Uh, on the right side, we have created a trending chart in Power BI. This could also be created in Excel or even in, an ex in a SQL query where you're grouping by month, perhaps. We can see in this case, it's important to look at the difference over time because even though apples overall during this time period had more sales than oranges, in the last couple of months, and even more so in the latest month, orange sales have been significantly higher than apples. You would miss that if you just looked at the overall comparison by product and you didn't trend it over time. You can also sometimes identify data issues this way. Now it's also very common to look at the year over year change over time. And that's important because in some cases, a trend could be driven by seasonality. So for instance, the spike we see here, we saw the same spike last year. Most metrics, uh, sales or whatnot, have at least some amount of seasonality. And that's where year over year comes in and looking at not just what's the year over year for this time period, but how has that year over year difference been trending? Now, it's very important to understand uh, and look back and see, well, what's really driving that? Was this driven by, if, if the year over year trend is changing, is this driven by a abnormally low last year and that's why it's high this year? or is it an abnormal high this year? And that's what's driving an increase in year-over-year -year growth. Um, so keep that in mind when you're looking at year-over-year -year growth, but it is very common to look at year-over-year -year change over time, by month, by quarter, by week. All right, now we're getting into data science. Let's talk about statistical analysis. At the heart of most statistical analysis techniques is the assumption of a distribution. In fact, there's a term for uh, models that use that. The term parametric means it's based on an assumption of a distribution. A lot of these techniques used a normal distribution or a bell curve. It's a very commonly seen distribution. Some examples of uh, statistical tests include hypothesis testing, such as a t-test, 
or building a confidence interval for a metric, or even getting into certain types of regression. Now in practice, I would say most analysts, especially outside of regulated industries like the medical industry, rarely take the time to actually apply a statistical test. Instead, it's often substituted for a general check to make sure that the difference is substantial. Uh, so one group, it's, it's not saying, well, this group has a value of 100 versus 101. That's not a very big difference from a percentage perspective. Uh, and that each one of those averages if, or sums that it's based on a sufficient sample. Uh, maybe making sure that each group has based on at least 100 observations. So really simple checks on statistical significance, but not necessarily taking the time to actually compute a t-test. That's just not saying that's the right or wrong thing, but that's often the way it goes, applying analytics at a lot of companies, especially your analytics level one and level two maturity companies. Now on the right side, I did want to show an example of a distribution uh, and an example of a t-test or confidence interval. So we have our uh, mean, our true mean here, and let's say that we pulled a certain sample and we found that the mean of that sample, the average of that sample, uh, was up here. It was three standard deviations higher than uh, the true mean. Our, our, or a hypothesized mean, our analysis would look at the likelihood that if we actually observed this kind of mean uh, for a certain sample size that we have observed it among, what is the likelihood that the true mean actually is our hypothesized mean? And if it's a very low likelihood that we could see a, an average on a certain sample size that high with the true mean being this, this level, uh, if there's only a two or 1% likelihood of that being the case, we would often reject the null hypothesis and state that we are quite confident that the mean of the population is higher than the hypothesized, the original hypothesized mean. Just one example of a statistical test. Now let's talk about data science modeling, which is sometimes referred to as machine learning or artificial intelligence. There's a fine line between all of those terms and a lot of people think about them differently. So we'll combine them together for now at least. Now within data science modeling, there are predictive models and there are prescriptive models. Predictive models focus on making some kind of a prediction for the purpose of perhaps planning. How many sales do we think we're gonna have next month so that we can plan our staff that's gonna to need to manufacture a certain amount of product? Or for prioritization, which consumers or which prospects do we think are most likely to buy? so that we can make sure to call them first, for instance. And then when it comes to prescriptive models, we're trying to understand what is the causal relationship? Is there a causal relationship between variables? We might wanna do this to calculate the return on investment. We need to know exactly how many sales a certain initiative is driving. Or perhaps we wanna build a prescriptive model to identify ways to drive more or less of a particular variable, a particular thing we want to measure and understand. Now, sometimes organizations will employ a data engineer that we've talked about in order to build the data set and then a data scientist to actually build the model. Now, in other organizations, it's kind of a all hands on deck approach where an analyst might be the one to create a visualization, perform an ad hoc analysis, build a model, build the data set for the model, all of the above. Every organization is different. There's different levels of specialization. Well, and there's also a lot of different types of data science models. And we have a few examples of those on the right here. So first we have a regression model. This is a example of a parametric model. A regression model relies on a certain distribution. If it's a linear model, it relies on the normal distribution. Then there's non-parametric models that don't rely on a variable having a particular distribution. A decision tree is an example of that. Um, a random forest model is a more advanced version of a decision tree. It's a set of many trees built in a way to optimize what's called the bias variance trade-off. We'll talk more about that when we get into data science. 
and then there's neural network models or deep learning models and those are some of the advanced most advanced uh, data science models that exist used to do things like determine what's in an image or uh, what sound uh, something made all kinds of things and that's a quick overview of data science modeling again we'll have a dedicated session to this later on in the series a b testing one of my favorite topics because it is absolutely the best way to determine if an initiative is working. It's also known as a scientific experiment. That's essentially what we do when we take a group of observations, which could be people or products or geographies, as we said before, and randomly assign about half of them to a test or treatment group and half of them to a control group. Now it doesn't have to be half. In fact, if you're really not sure this is going to work, you might go with a 20% or 10% group, especially if you have a large number of observations that should be fine. Or in some cases, people are very confident. They want to have a holdout population to know the impact of the change and they might go with 80, 90% in the treatment group and 10 or 20% in the holdout group but you'll get the absolute best read on the test if you take 50% of the population and assign it randomly to the treatment group or the test group and the remainder to the control group. The great thing about this approach is that the only thing that is different if they are truly randomly assigned uh, to the tr test and control groups is that the treatment, the treatment will be applied to the test group which means that when you observe the differences uh, across the two groups, any differences, especially if they're statistically significant, can be applied to the treatment. It is a very robust approach. There's no selection bias through the random selection process. Now, what you might do, especially as you st even, even as you start to design the A-B test, maybe you've randomly selected the test and control group and uh, you just want to be sure that it was absolutely random you can use excel random generation or python random generation but you want to be sure that these two groups are truly random what you might do is select the groups and then plot out their performance in the metric that you want to measure like sales for instance uh, monitor what the difference has been over time and what you should see is that the two groups are essentially lockstep over time. So again, we're doing a trending analysis here, and you do see, you will see some natural variation, some randomness in there. So in this case, in this particular month, the control group performed a little bit better than the test group. Uh, and that was the case for the next month too. And then the test group performed a little bit better. But what you should see is that there's not a consistent difference across the two groups, especially prior to introducing the treatment. So in this case, there's a month when the treatment gets applied, maybe it's July, 2022 in this case, and that's where we're really interested in what happens next between these two groups. Uh, what happens to the test group? In some cases that we want the metric to go up, in some cases the goal could be to bring a metric down. Whatever it is, what we should see is that there starts to be some separation across the groups if the treatment is actually having some kind of an impact. And so in this case, we see that the two groups are pretty much in lockstep. A treatment gets applied, and then, especially after two to three months, we start to see a consistent difference between the two. Now, we would wanna go and do a t-test to make sure that difference is statistically significant, but at least visually you can see there is a consistent difference where the test group is consistently performing higher than the control group whereas before we introduced that treatment they were pretty much performing at the same level so just visually looking at this i would be pretty confident about saying that the treatment had at least some impact on average sales per customer this is a great visual uh, to show to an executive to prove that this treatment had an impact. Now, at the end of the A-B test, we'll want to assess the difference between the test and control groups before the test, pre-test, and post-test. We might create a visual like this that uh, highlights the overall differences during those two time periods. 
In this case, since the test started, the treatment was introduced to the test group in July 2022. Our pre-test period, uh, January 2022 through June 2022, we saw a very minor difference across the groups. They were randomly selected, and so there shouldn't be a very large difference. There always be somewhat of a difference due to random variation. But in this case, we could see that the test group, their average sales per customer, was 98.5 versus the control groups was 100.3. So the test group was 1.8% lower in terms of average sales per customer than the control group in the pre-test pre period. We wanna compare that to what the difference was like in the post-test period, in this case, July 2022 through February 2023. And in that, during that time period, we actually saw that the test group was 21.6% higher in terms of average sales per customer than the control group. So what we might do is if we thought that there was a possibility, there was a systemic difference, we might control for the pre-test difference of negative 1.8%, subtract that out from the difference we saw in the post-test period. And what we would suggest is that the treatment uh, introduced in July 2022 to the test group had the impact of increasing sales per customer by 23.4%. We can also see this visually. We, we saw the overtime visual, but sometimes it's nice to see things aggregated up by time period, by test group or control group. We see again, during the pre-period, the groups are very similar in terms of average sales per customer. And post-period, the groups are quite different. The test group is clearly higher than the control group. So that's another way of visually showing what the impact was. Now another thing, um, and before we move on, uh, we would want to conduct perhaps a t-test, a statistical test, to determine whether that difference was statistically significant. Now you might also decide to build a data science model that could, one, be used to determine whether there's a statistical significance. So you could do a t-test, but you could also set it up as a regression model. And your target variable would be whether or not a customer was in the test group. And you'd be seeing what impact that had on sales per customer. That's another way of measuring the statistical significance. If the p-value of that is the observation in the test group or not, if the p-value of that coefficient is positive and it's statistically significant, yes, we did. We had an impact and it's statistically significant. Now, another thing you can do, especially if you get into a response model, a mixed model that has interaction variables, is you might be able to assess whether, not just whether there's an overall positive impact or negative impact of a treatment, but whether that treatment impact varies depending on other characteristics. Maybe the treatment works really well in a certain uh, characteristic or a certain profile of customer and not so much in other profiles. You can use interaction variables to assess whether that's the case. All right, now it's time to take what we've learned and actually apply some of these concepts to example requests that you could face as an analyst first question that you might get perhaps from an executive. It might get a request like this. I'd like to have some visibility into how our sales are performing. If you were to get that request, how would you approach it? What techniques would you use? How would you set it up? Let us know. Or how about if you got this request from perhaps a marketing stakeholder? I'd like to understand if geographic areas where we spend more on marketing typically see more sales. That might help you assess whether your marketing is working or not. How would you set that up? What techniques that we've talked about would you potentially be able to use to provide an answer to that question? This is a challenge that is probably all too common for sales teams. So a sales manager might approach you with the following challenge. Today, each of our salespeople have about a thousand customers in their territory that they could potentially call or visit. Each salesperson has their own way of determining when and which customers to visit and how often, but I feel like we should be able to give them some kind of recommendations based on data. Is there any way we can use analytics to help them? How would you approach that? 
what techniques that you learned about today could potentially be used to solve that problem. Okay, last one. How would you address this request? We're planning on launching a new online marketing campaign where we'll send follow-up ads to visitors on our website. We'd like your help to analyze the campaign. What techniques could you potentially use to measure that? Learning concepts is great, but where you really learn is when the rubber meets the road and you actually apply these concepts to real situations. So before you watch the next video, I highly recommend thinking through how you would address each one of these requests. And if you're brave enough, maybe leave the, your approach in the comment section. In the next session, we'll start off addressing these and I will give you at least my approach for how I would typically handle these. Now there could be multiple robust approaches, but hopefully we can collaborate on a solution for our four stakeholders here. Now you might be asking the question, what happens after all seven sessions are over? Where is that going to leave me after I've made that kind of investment of my time? Well, for those of you that are passionate about pursuing a career in analytics, you can use the recommended resources after each session to keep learning and dive in more to a particular topic. This training series should provide you with really good context that'll better prepare you to dive in and learn more about each topic. Okay, ready for your homework? In addition to thinking about your answers to those four potential analytics use cases, I'd like you to brainstorm a way of using analytics at your organization or even in your personal life, whether it's your finances and planning expenses, or maybe a hobby of yours, like a particular sports team that you follow. Whatever it is, think of some good ways of using analytics and applying it to a, a use case. That is going to be a big way that you can stand out compared to other analysts if you have the ability not just to complete an analysis when it's given to you, but also recommending what's possible with analytics. So have a shot at that. I wanna thank you for watching today. I know it's a time investment, but I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. And if you have, please consider liking the video. And if you'd like to see more training videos like this, please consider subscribing to our channel. Hopefully we'll see you at our next session on Excel data manipulation. It's gonna be a good one. And if you'd like to learn more about how value-driven analytics can help your organization drive value with data, please visit us at valuedrivenanalytics.com or consider calling us at 1-877-825-3786. That's 1-877-VALDRVN. We'd love to talk to you.